Welcome to Montreal Rocks. And today we're very excited to have with us uh, a band that you might know from the earlier days, probably more in my, my age group, but uh, from the Watchmen, we have a new rebirth of a band called Serlin Graves. And today we have Daniel Graves, who obviously is now doing a project with Joey Serlin. So happy to have you. Straight from the motel, I see. Yeah, this is my. Uh, well, the bars have been closed for a while, so I've I've converted it in, into my uh, into my Zoom office. Um, yeah, you know things are uh, things are okay. We're we're starting to starting to reopen, and uh, it'll it'll soon soon return to a bar <laughs> to what it was intended to be. And, and it's it it is a motel with no rooms. Uh, it is, and you know what? When we were open pre-pandemic, I would say uh, probably get three or four calls a week for people, <laughs> people looking for rooms. Uh, so I said, no, no, it's not, no rooms. I get it, I get the confusion, but it's just called motel bar. And the idea is that there's a bunch of hotels on the on on the better side on, across the bridge. So we figured, oh, this is sort of the the shabbier side of the bridge. So we decided to call it motel. But of course, it's a very musical place. I mean. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I believe that the picture behind me is from, I, I'm assuming you're- Yeah, yeah, we, we, did, uh, we did a lot of the, if not, well, most of the, of the, uh, the photography was around. Yeah, that's the, what, what I'm looking at now is the, is the front door, a uh, little motel uh, on the window. Um, so yeah, it just, it, it's one of those really vibey spots, uh, dark and red lights, and it just sort of, it, it kind of, it made for the uh, it made for the idea of sad songs for sale, and you actually literally sell songs because you have vinyl swaps. You yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was sort of something. Um, it was just it, it just sort of ended up being like sort of so it's motel bar and records. So we um, I have a guy. It's not my collection. I have a guy who curates it. But uh, yeah, we sell lots of lots of vinyl it feels like when people have a few too many drinks perhaps they uh, they feel like buying music so it's uh it's a match made in heaven i i buy music all the time very sober yeah and, and with a drink or two yeah well it it, it happens both ways but it's, it's addictive. I, I, it is addictive absolutely so, first of all um i'm sorry for your loss Oh yeah, I know. I was I was just really like, oh geez, I'm talking, I'm talking to Montreal this morning. Yeah, yeah, it, it's I'll a, it's not, a, I'll try a not pretty to this too much. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a pretty rough go. I was gonna wear my Jets hat, but I figured. I, well, you know what? But I'm also the kind of fan where you know I, I'm not. I, I'm I would I'm the kind of fan now where there's no way I'm gonna be rooting for an American team. I mean, I I it, it was a. Uh, I mean, I wasn't expecting a sweep, obviously. I don't think anybody was. Uh, but also, the Jets sweeping Edmonton, nobody was expecting it, that either. It could so, have been a hot trick there that we, you guys were on fire. I mean, uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I felt that the, that the days off uh, uh, slowed us down a bit. But I mean, you can't, blame, you can't blame the days off by the time game three and four come around. So, um, yeah, it, you know what? It was a pretty sad, uh, a pretty sad moment. But you know, we we went through a lot of years not having a team, so uh, just the fact that they're back and they and they're not going anywhere is uh, I always sort of throw to that saying. You know, there were a lot of years where we didn't have a team, so um, I'm happy about that. I try and I try and look on the bright side of things. So, I mean, let's bring it back to music. Uh, one of the yeah. things uh, your your hotel well motel bar is known for playing the Winnipeg Jets game, so you're kind of uh, known for that. Uh, and then we have the vinyl. But let's go back a little bit into your history. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I would like to take you back when you were maybe a young child, uh, mm -hmm. you're maybe flipping through your parents' vinyl collection. Right. Uh, and maybe there's a song or a band that kind of spoke to you or music kind of went from something you heard to something you felt. Was there a moment in your childhood where that kind of just flicked that switch? Uh, I, 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 wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say there's a moment particularly, but as in the process of you asking that question, the first thing I think about is, um, is Simon and Garfunkel's Sounds of Silence, because my mom had that vinyl, and I wore it out, and, um, and that, that is, that is music, like, that style of music is still, uh, it still resonates today, um, it, for me, you know, like, again, talk, talking about sad songs, there's a lot of, a lot of sadness on that record, um, and yeah, so I, I would I wouldn't say a moment a moment particularly, but but definitely um, definitely that's that's the album and that that's that sort of musical sensibility was was a big 
uh, was a big part. And uh, I still remember that. There's a song called Richard Corey on that record that that I sang a cappella for about 15 years. It's sort of a it was a poem, and uh, and so I just you know it, in terms of that, I I can tell from hearing it as as you know a preteen even, and the fact that it it lived so uh, so long in in my music, and I, I still sing it. I mean you know occasionally I have a few a cappella songs that I. Apparently you have about six in your back pocket. If I yeah, I, I have I have a few. And a lot of times when I'm going to start and saying, oh, should I do that one? Should I do that one? You know, there's a, there's a few that that live in my repertoire and that's definitely one of them. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say that that uh, that record had a really big effect on me as a kid. OK, I'm going to say two things and I want you to paint us a picture of that story and what message you were sending that day. Yeah. Scissors and the film The Ugly Duckling. Scissors. <laughs> I'm thinking it's scissors. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was scissors. Well, that that was that was an, that's an old story. That's uh, you 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 you've done you've done your research. Um, yeah, that ha that happened at a school I was going to uh, when I was a kid. I think it might have been. I just I think I just asked my mom about this. It might have been grade two or grade three, but uh, I I came home uh, from school that day and I asked her what the N word meant. Uh, I didn't even. I didn't even say it right because I'd never, I'd never heard it. Um, and, and she lost, she lost it because, <laughs> uh, you know, she's my mom and I was just like, you know, I didn't know. So they, they put this whole thing together, you know, unbeknownst to me, I found out about it years later, but they, they gathered all the grade twos. I think she said it was grade two. So I was eight, seven, maybe. I was grade two. Uh, yeah. Uh, so and they gathered everyone together and they showed them the, the film, the ugly duckling. And the idea was, that it was for my benefit, but I didn't know at that time. It was like, it, that was the way they, they tried to fix things in, you know, 1978. Um, and I guess the, and it's funny because the, the, the message of, of that is, is don't, or, or the message I took from it, I guess, as a grade two person, uh, without that sort of, you know, so the sophistication of, of somebody older, was it? Don't worry. If you're if you're a, a dark duck, you'll eventually uh, you'll eventually grow up to be a, a beautiful white swan. So uh, I think it was the wrong message. And then yeah. whatever. Long story short, I was a kid. Everyone went up for recess. I found my way into the uh, into the the little film projector room, and I destroyed the film. And I got caught, and you know. <laughs> uh insanity ensued uh but yeah and, you know and and you don't you never realize as a kid uh, the the stories that that resonate with you or, or why they'll resonate or how they resonate but you know the fact that I'm now 45 years older um the fact that I remember I have very specific memories of, of that of those moments say so you obviously know that um that there was a reason why you remember it. There was something that resonated, and it is. It was very powerful, and and something that. I mean, obviously, you read it and picked up on it, and it is. Uh, it's an interesting story, and and again, I I have no regrets about anything. But I was the only I was the only kid who had any color going to the school that I was going to, so it didn't bother me. Uh, but it, it definitely you know uh, had it had its effect. Now I'm in Toronto. Uh, you know, people, I'm a dime a dozen in terms of people who <laughs> me, it's, it's all over the map, but, you know, in small town Winnipeg or in Winnipeg um, in the seventies, it wasn't, it wasn't the same thing. The only piece people of color that I knew was my dad and his, and his crazy family. So, um, so yeah, that, that, uh, that definitely made a, that made a mark on me and, um, but not one that I, that I regret. That's for sure. No, I, I think, um, that's the, the trouble when we're young, we don't have the full picture. I took, I think you took a stand, you, you kind of did something to get out of your comfort zone to, to take mm. a stand. You might not even know what it was. And, and maybe that relates to your, the first single off your album, Teenage Heart. You know, we, we don't understand who we are until oftentimes later on in life. And we sometimes don't even accept who we are until later well, on in life. Absolutely, it, it's, a, it's a lifelong journey. I mean, I know there's a lot of people <laughs> that, that are my age and your age that that still don't know who they are. There, there's no, there's no, I mean, what you said about, you know, you don't realize things younger. I actually, what, what one of my, how I feel in certain regards is it's, it's almost, uh, it's almost sort of a, a protectionary kind of thing. You know, I, I, 
I, I, I didn't, I, I shouldn't have known what that, what that word meant at that age. And I shouldn't have known that somebody was trying to, I mean, and it, even, I don't even think, I don't even recall if that, they, they, no, no, nobody was calling me that. They were just, it was just like, oh, are you, you know, and I, I was just, you know, like, but I, I, it's better. It feels like it's a, it's a safety, it's a safety switch that you don't, you don't realize everything when you were a kid. And I think there's a benefit to looking back and saying, oh, okay, well, that's, you know, I, I'm definitely not going to, you know, teach my kids not to, not to do those sorts of things. It's definitely, uh, but I definitely got the, got the full picture later on. And I'm actually grateful that I didn't have the full picture when I was eight, you know, because that would have been harder to take, I think. You mentioned the word safety switch. And I think that's what you relate in the song. Uh, kids today uh, with social media and all the pressures and the bullying, they don't have a safety switch. They can't turn it off or they don't want to turn it off. Yeah, How is no, that affecting them? Yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, I have, uh, you know, I have, I have teenagers and I mean, uh, you know, every, everyone's kids are the best. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, there's, you know, I don't, I try to know everything that's happening, but at the same time, I recognize that that's impossible. You know, I'll, I'll, my, my, my son's the one who, who showed me how to do the Zoom thing, you know, like you, <laughs> I'm looking, looking at the younger generation. Uh, there, there's something called age compression, the, a, a term I heard a lot of years ago, and it, and it uh, I, I think it was coined by the, by the children's television, you know, ne uh, conglomerate, where if you notice, like the things that, the things that kids are growing up on now is so much more, like a 10 year old now knows way more than a 10 year old yeah. in the seventies. And that, True. you know, I think that they, they talk about that term in terms of what, well, you can't put out the same stuff that I was watching at 10. You got to put out stuff that's a little, a little edgier that gets them, you know, that grows them up faster. And um, that's, you know, that's the TV biz. And, but at the same time, it's, it's not great. You know, but you, you even look at the, look at the Halloween costumes from, from the seventies. And then you look at these. They were so innocent. I mean, yeah. And then you look at these things now and it's like, my God, how can they sell that stuff? This is for, you know, and they, it's so it's, it's a, it's a real, it's a real, uh, it's a real true thing. And I don't think there's any stopping it. Honestly, people, for some reason, people want to grow up faster. Um, and, and that's just what's happening. So it's about, it's about guarding, you know, guarding your kids, keeping them close. And, you know, I mean, a lot of times I feel like I'm just hanging on, you know, <laughs> in terms of what they're doing. I, I trust them and we've I've raised them well and all that. But yeah, there's there's a lot of scary things hiding around a lot of corners, you know. And you're you're also trying to support the, the kids help line as well with the. Yeah, that that, 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 was, that was something that was important. I mean, you know, if we wrote songs 20 years ago, they might have been or when we wrote songs 20 years ago, they might've been about kids on all fours, you know, like toddlers <laughs> crawling around. But now, now we have teenagers and, and a lot of, a lot of raising kids gets easier, but uh, a lot of it gets harder. And um, I don't know if, if, I mean, Joe wrote that tune. I, I don't know if he, if he meant to, I, it was a bit of an afterthought in terms of putting the, <clears throat> excuse me, putting the, the phone number at the bottom uh but it just it felt right because mm -hmm. it it just felt like it was just sort of trying to speak not necessarily to a generation i mean speaking to to our teenagers but you know in in doing so um maybe it's it's speaking to some others as well and um you know mental health is a big deal these days uh, thankfully you know we're able to talk about it more and um you know take it take it out of the closet uh, in terms of uh in terms of, oh no, you can't talk about that. You can like the generations now, they're, they're talking about that stuff. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's, uh, it's only of benefit. What's interesting is happy songs make us happy, but sad mm -hmm. songs don't necessarily make us sad. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the name of the record, Sad Songs for Sale, for me, I, 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 I always love the sad tunes, you know, like that's just like the, uh, I, I wanted to do, uh, it was an idea I had about, and I'm a big REM fan, but, uh, and I, I love the last songs on records and especially the last songs on well, REM records. There are always these, these plaintive, these plaintive sort of moments that, that may, they may have some attachment to the 11 previous songs on the record, but there's always like, you know, in the days when we had records, it was just always like, uh, just this, 
this place to end up on this sort of righteous uh, spot. And, um, you know, I've always, I've always loved that. We have, I mean, the last song on our record is when we knew that song was going to be on the record, we knew it was going to be last. It just sort of, it just speaks of, it, it's, it's definitely apart from a lot of the other stuff. And I don't know, it's just this, it's this, this, you want to put a nice piece of punctuation at the end of, you know, 12 songs that are actually meant to be a full record. It's meant to be like a beginning, middle and end. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that you want, you want a real a strong punctuation at the end of that. And so again, yes, sad songs don't necessarily, but, but even when they do make us sad, uh, there, there's, there's a cathartic thing. I mean, I wouldn't, I'm not, you don't, people don't go out and aim to be sad listening to music, but for me, when I put on a sad tune, uh, it's, uh, and I do that a lot. That's just part of my, you know, part of my musical therapy. I, I just, it makes me, you know, uh, contemplative or it just makes me look further or, or whatever it does for, for, for the listener. But we, we work through things with our yeah, emotions. Absolutely. Problems. Yeah. And, and, and then you get to the other side of it and then it ends, you get to the other side of it and you, you listen to it again or you throw on you know a dance tune or, or whatever like what, what, whatever you need to get out of your uh, out of your music but but for me sad sad tunes have always have always been a real uh, a real important thing for me in, in my music fandom i know that they say that it takes a lifetime you know you have a lifetime to write your first album but that second <laughs> album is always so hard but mm -hmm. would you say that you had a lifetime to write this album um well it, it, there was definitely definitely you've had some songs time. that you've been carrying around for years right yeah yeah i mean there, there was definitely you know definitely that uh, that idea we had enough time you know <sighs> one of one of the things that i i really like about this record and, and the process of it is it, it felt very organic to me it wasn't and and joe joe may may say something different he, he might have been a bit more focused than i was when when we started but um it was just sort of the fact that it was like, hey man, I got this tune. You want to come and sing on this tune? He has a studio not far from the bar. So, okay, so I'll go, I'll go over there for an hour. Then I'd bring in a song. Hey, do you want to play some rock and roll all over this? And and so to me, it, was, it wasn't like, okay, we're making a record and okay, we got one tune, let's get 12 tunes, I get 10 tunes or whatever. It was just more about, let's just, I'm working with a guy that I've known for more than four decades, you know, as, as close as, as family as, as possible. And then at the end of the process, six or seven months later, I'm just sort of thinking, hey man, I think, uh, I think we've got a record here. So what, what I really appreciated about the process is that it was, it was authentic and organic. And for me, I was just, just my head was down, let's get this tune, let me sing this one. Hey, wants to try this guitar here, let's try this harmony. And it just, it ended up becoming uh, something really special and it was a little accidental from from my. I mean, I knew that I knew the songs were good, but I didn't I didn't know that there was going to be, you know, I didn't feel at the beginning of it there was going to be this package. It's, it's probably it, better uh, that way because you're not focused so. on trying to make something successful. You're just doing something that pleases you, and in turn, well, it pleases your fans. Right. Well, and, and that's the thing too is that you know uh, it it, re it was sort of returning back to the time when we were you know, rehearsing in Joey's basement and, and like when there was no, no money involved, there was no record company. Oh, I don't hear a single. There was so like, we were doing it for ourselves. And, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that, you know, it's not the primary way that I, that I feed my family. So the, so there's just so, so much less pressure um, to, to, to deal with. And you're doing it really, as they say on the bachelor for all the right reasons. Um, and so that's, um, that was something that I, I really, I, I really hear that in the, in the record when, when I, when I listen to it, I just hear, yeah, we just did, we're doing what we want. And there's no one saying we don't have a manager. We don't have, I mean, a record company, Joe's record company, the indie, 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 everything. Um, and, and we just sort of, uh, it, it feels like the, the results really reflect, really reflect that, um, that idea, you know? And you have, obviously gathered quite a following with your former band or well, even current band, The Watchmen. Yeah. Uh, how is this project connecting with your fans, your, the, the fans of the original project? Uh, so far, it, everything's been very, very positive. Um, I think there are, you know, me and Joey being from The Watchmen for 30 years, I mean, obviously there's going to be, uh, I mean, you'd hope there'd be some crossover and you would expect that a lot of songs, you know, would probably 
could very well have been on a on a Watchmen record. It didn't, you know, turn out that way. We wanted a, a new idea and a new project and just new influences and new players and and all that. But um, I feel I feel Teenage Heart uh, uh, could have could have Watchmen written all over it. And and maybe it'll show up in, in a Watchmen uh, in a Watchmen set. We have some <laughs> some shows booked. Hopefully everything goes as it should in the next few months, and and we'll see. I think I think it's possible that we could uh, we could hear some of that music. Yeah, you have a, a show yeah. coming up at the Horseshoe Tavern on June yeah, that's fourth. Uh, right, June twenty fourth. That that's well, no, actually, that, that's the live stream. Yeah, no, but it's also been moved because of various different stages of reopening. It's actually on August 12th now. So that's, oh, okay. uh, that's, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, they it was supposed to be right around the release and then they moved it and they moved it. Things are, things are just still challenging on this, uh, on this side of the border. So keep your eye on the Horseshoe Tavern, Hoot and Nanny uh, page yep. and you'll, you'll get the right date. Um, do you experience fame, obviously in the nineties, uh, mid nineties, especially? How do you think fame has changed over the last twenty-five to thirty years? It's very different uh, beast than it was back then. Yeah, I think I think social media has has definitely fueled fueled that idea. Just the the you know, it's I honestly I, I feel I feel like an old man in terms of how how kids are doing what what they're doing. But you know, again, it's um, I mean, it's 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 getting it's getting bigger and badder quicker. You know, and you can you know, get in there with one song and cash in and cash out. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I guess because it happened, I mean, and this is, I wouldn't fame, I mean, you know, in Canada, you know, sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm not <clears throat> I'm recognized on the, on the street occasionally and still, and that's, that's amazing. But um, it's, um, it was, I don't know. I think it feels like it was easier back then. It was easier. And maybe because there's so many people that were, that are, that are so young now. Um, like yeah, 15, 16 year olds starting out and getting this like enormous fame and the and scrutiny, having, right? The, yeah, the scrutiny and the social media and the, you know everybody it, has a phone, everybody can record you. Yeah, you can see you everything. Can't, you can't go to Starbucks wearing like just a, a regular t-shirt. You have to. Yeah, no, there, there, there's a lot. There's a lot to. Uh, there's a lot more to digest. A lot more, you know, just a lot more happening. And again, the rewards can be greater quicker. But but I think also the, um, you know, the downfalls can be greater quicker as well. So um, I'm grateful that I started when I was starting. I my my. You know, I'll I'll go play a sold out show at the Danforth in Toronto, and then come to the bar and plunge the toilet. You know, yeah. so it's just sort of you get to I, you get to come down back to earth. Yeah, I I, I or or if, if it, back in the day changing the diapers or or what like you just there, it doesn't take long to to get to get knocked back down into place when you're when when you started uh, when we started. So, um, but again, I wouldn't I wouldn't take that I wouldn't take it any other way. Uh, but let's uh, end off with uh, uh, something I like to call uh, uh, fantasy rock band. You've probably heard of fantasy, uh, fantasy football or fantasy mm -hmm. hockey leagues. I like to play fantasy rock band because I'm a little bit more into music than I am into sports. I okay, fair that. enough. So I want you to uh, create the ultimate rock band. Uh, past, present, dead or alive. We need like a, a guitarist, a bassist, a drummer and a singer. Oh my! Um, well, I'm a, I'm a I'm a fan of Eddie Vedder's voice, uh, so let, let let let's start at the front of the stage, um, where, where where the lights are nice and warm. Um, drummer, I go with drummer second. Uh, Steve Gadd, who <clears throat> he's just sort of a classic session guy who's played played with Simon and Garfunkel, just the lightest the lightest hands and the lightest touch. Um, bass player god well i'm not gonna say ken he's the only bass player i really know i could say ken i, I, I like ken's playing ken from the watchman i mean um oh gosh uh, guitar um <clears throat> johnny marr <clears throat> i like his moves and for some reason uh well and then and maybe uh maybe p and whistle from the who I mean that that'd be a crazy band but but uh yeah so okay so let's say eddie better up front Johnny Marr on guitar, uh, Steve Gadd on the drums, John Entwistle on the bass. A lot of these uh, artists that you chose do have sad songs. Uh, I yeah, mean, well, I, you know what? 
<laughs> it, it's definitely something that resonates. You know, it, it's it, it, it's my favorite. Uh, like Joey said this in the past, and I feel the same way. I don't know if I've ever written a happy song. <laughs> uh, I don't like it, it. It can be celebratory, and the beats per minute can be can be urgent. But but there's always I don't know. There's always sort of a a, a darkness uh, hang, hanging around. Uh, and I guess I've always I've always felt that it's 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 easier to to say thoughtful things when when there's a bit of when there's a bit of mournful mournfulness uh, surrounding uh, the lyrics and the music sometimes. So yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think back on the songs that I've written and they're all, I mean, they're not tear jerkers and, and there's, and you know, I, I don't oh, really there's write. Death. There's a reflection. Yeah, I, it, it just, it, I, it's the stuff that I like to listen to. I like things that like a, a slower tempos that, <clears throat> that let you, there's more time, in, there's more time to, 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 to hear what's being said when when it's a little slower when and you know so the, the, those are just those are things that I've always uh, places I've always gone uh, with music and you know Joey had uh, one of this tune I can't even think uh, might be Porchlight where the where the lyrics sad songs for sale is in it and he that's what we were trying to oh, which we call it and there was like this or that or name it after a song and when he said that I said yeah well that's a great line and. Um, and it's just so true of, of this whole record. I, I don't, you know, I don't think there's, it's not like a sad record, but um, it, it just, it's the songs that we've written. And I know that Joey, you know, with the kind of songs like Love You Less and Morning Song, like those are, those are mournful, thoughtful moments. And, um, you know, he's, he's like me in terms of the songs that he, that he gravitates towards on, on records. And, and that's been, that's been our move for, and what I've loved for almost for, well, three, more than three decades. So um, it felt, it felt truly correct. So the, the album is available to stream. Uh, you have vinyl as well, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, we'll have all the links in the show notes. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we My really pleasure. enjoyed speaking to you and we look forward to uh, you playing some live shows. Uh, even if you wear a Winnipeg's a jersey, it's fine. Oh, You'll be accepted in Montreal. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll see about that. <laughs> uh, uh, speaking for myself. You're okay. I appreciate your time, Randall. Thank you for, uh, thanks for the chat.